Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes found. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Kimberly Cargill was born on November 20th, 1966 in Mississippi. She eventually moved to Texas with her mother and stepfather. Over the years, Kimberly had three husbands and four children. Between the years of 1993 and 1995, she was married to Brian Cargill and the two had one son together. Kimberly was not the primary caretaker for two of her sons and was only living with her two youngest boys, Luke and Zach. In 2010, Kimberly was under investigation by Child Protective Services for allegedly assaulting Zach. CPS concluded that Zach and his brother Luke should be removed from Kimberly's custody. On May 18, 2010, Kimberly violated a voluntary agreement giving temporary custody of Luke to her mother Rachel Wilson. On that particular day, Rachel was supposed to pick up Luke from daycare, but Kimberly ended up picking up Luke and refused to give him to her mother or to CPS. CPS then had to go through the court, and they were able to obtain an emergency order of protection and returned Luke to his grandmother Rachel on June 3, 2010. A custody hearing was then scheduled for June 23, 2010. Kimberly had a nanny that would often watch her sons. The nanny's name was Cherry Walker. Cherry Walker was a 39-year-old African-American woman that was mentally challenged. Although Cherry would help Kimberly with her children and home, Cherry also had a caretaker by the name of Paula Wheeler. Five days before Kimberly's custody hearing, on Friday, June 18th, at 10 o'clock in the morning, Cherry was served with a subpoena to testify at the custody hearing. Paula was with Cherry when she was served and ended up reading the subpoena to her. Cherry was upset with the idea of having to testify, so she called Kimberly. When she spoke with Kimberly to let her know that she had been served, Kimberly's first response was to tell Cherry not to tell anyone. She also told Cherry that she would hide her in her home on the day of the hearing because she did not have to testify. Although Cherry was not able to communicate that Paula already knew about the subpoena and that she was not alone, Kimberly soon found out that Paula was there and could hear their conversation. Kimberly asked Cherry to hand the phone over to Paula and she agreed. When Paula got on the phone, she told Paula that she would not be a real friend if she allowed Cherry to testify at the hearing because the court would only upset and confuse Cherry. She asked Paula if anyone else knew about the subpoena and Paula let her know that she did tell her supervisor about the situation. After their phone conversation ended, phone records show that Kimberly initiated over 70 text messages, emails, and calls that day. One person she was able to speak with was a neighbor by the name of Marcy Fulton. Marcy would also watch Kimberly's boys on occasion. Kimberly learned that Marcy was also subpoenaed, so she told Marcy to leave town or hide on the court day, and if she did not want to do that, she should only say good things about her in court. Little did Kimberly know, Cherry also called Marcy to let her know that she was served. Cherry and Marcy agreed to testify and not to lie for Kimberly on the stand. Cherry also let Marcy know that Kimberly invited her to dinner at 7.55 p.m. and offered to pay her a large sum of money to clean her house. Getting back to Kimberly, the next person she was able to speak with was a friend by the name of Angela Hardin. Kimberly told Angela that her mentally challenged nanny was subpoenaed for the hearing and she thought that Cherry would ruin everything for her. If they find out, if they find out something is wrong with Cherry, they're, Cherry going my, they're going to take my baby from me. It's very possible that I could Kimberly then spoke with another friend by the name of Bill Selman. She told Bill that she was scared she would lose custody of her kids because the court would know she let a mentally challenged woman watch them. Back on Cherry's end, her caretaker Paula took her to see her supervisor, Partena Young. Partena copied the subpoena for Cherry's file and then called the assistant district attorney so she could explain to him that Cherry was mentally challenged. After that incident, Cherry made it back to her apartment but she was still worried and scared. At 7.55 p.m., the same time Cherry told Marcy that Kimberly would be picking her up for dinner, Cherry decided to call her caretaker Paula. She told Paula about the plans of going out to dinner and receiving a large sum of money to clean Kimberly's house, and she also told Paula that she did not want to go out to eat with Kimberly because she already ate and she was full. Paula told Cherry to take her medicine, go to bed, and not to answer the door if anyone came. Paula knew that Cherry was easily manipulated. She spoke with Cherry every single day, but that would be the last time they ever spoke to each other. 
For whatever reason, Cherry did not take the advice that Paula gave her, and she ended up leaving her apartment with Kimberly a short time after the call had ended. That would be the last time anyone would see or hear from Cherry again, because the next day at around 3.20 p.m., Cherry's dead, charred body was found on a rural road that was about 10 miles away from her apartment. An autopsy was conducted on Cherry, and the cause of death was ruled as asphyxiation. Investigators found a coffee cream container next to Cherry's body and kept it as evidence and also tested it for DNA. Huma Nasir worked at a private accredited DNA forensics lab, and she said that the container was submitted for skin cell testing, and it is possible to get multiple results of multiple people touching an object, but there was not enough DNA to gather any real information. She then did a more specific test called a mini-SDR test, and she was able to get a DNA profile of two people, and Kimberly Cargill could not be excluded as a contributor. She said that one in 226,000 people could have a DNA profile that matched the DNA on the creamer, and Kimberly could not be excluded as the one. There were also less than 226,000 people who lived in Smith County, Texas, so Kimberly was suspect number one when it came to why Cherry Walker died. When investigators initially tried making contact with Kimberly, she refused to let them in her house. Investigators were eventually able to get inside of her home on another occasion, and they found the same coffee cream containers that was found by Cherry's body inside of Kimberly's home. After searching Kimberly's home and car, they found some of Cherry's belongings, and they eventually discovered that Kimberly was due in court soon, and Cherry was supposed to testify, but Kimberly did not want that. Kimberly was soon arrested and sent to jail. While in jail, she phoned multiple people to ask them if they could go to her house in White House, Texas to remove any evidence. When trial began, Kimberly took to the stand and gave the accounts of what happened the night Cherry Walker died. She said that she arrived at Cherry's house at 8.30 in the evening to take her out to dinner. She said that before heading off to the restaurant, she stopped at her house because she was supposed to meet her friend, Bill, so they could discuss the custody hearing, but Bill did not show up. Kimberly stated that she still went inside of her house to charge her phone, and Cherry waited in the car by herself. Kimberly left her phone in the house to charge and decided to leave. She claimed that they made it to the restaurant, ate, and had a nice time and a good conversation. On the way home, she said that Cherry requested to be taken to a bar because she thought her boyfriend would be there. Kimberly said that she did not want to go to a bar, so without saying anything, she started driving to Cherry's apartment. Cherry eventually realized that Kimberly was taking her home, and Kimberly claimed that Cherry got so upset that she began to have a seizure. Kimberly said that she did not know what to do, so she panicked and was not able to think rationally. She did not call 911 because she did not have her phone with her, and she admitted that she did pass a hospital that was just blocks away from Cherry's apartment, but she was in the wrong lane and did not want to hold up traffic. After ignoring the hospital, she said that she made her way to Cherry's apartment complex and got out of the car. She began knocking on doors of different apartments looking for help, but no one answered the door. When she made it back to the car, she opened the passenger side door and Cherry, who was still having a seizure, fell on the ground and hit her head. Kimberly said that she stopped moving for a few seconds after that. When the court was made aware of the fact that Kimberly was a licensed vocational nurse, Kimberly said that she did try to administer CPR, but it did not work. She then lifted Cherry back in the car and she started to drive toward the hospital. Right before entering the hospital, she said that she changed her mind because she knew that Cherry had been dead for five minutes and not only was there nothing the hospital could do, but they would most likely blame her for Cherry dying and she didn't want to make herself look bad. She said that she drove around with Cherry's body in the car for 45 minutes around town before ending up on a country road about 8 to 10 miles away from Cherry's apartment. She then admitted on the stand that she doused Cherry with lighter fluid in an attempt to cover up any DNA that was on Cherry's clothing. She also wanted to eliminate her DNA from her mouth after she had performed CPR. The next day, she said she washed all of her clothes in order to get rid of any evidence. She then went to the police station to falsely report a lost dog in order to find out if they knew anything about Cherry. She also admitted on the stand that she called a few friends and lied to them in order to create an alibi. She told friends that she did not take Cherry out to dinner, and she told another friend that she had not seen Cherry at all. She told Bill Selman that Cherry went to go with a quote-unquote white man. After Kimberly testified, Dr. Meredith Land took to the stand. She conducted Cherry's autopsy on June 20th and now concluded that Cherry's cause of death was homicidal violence. She could not pinpoint the exact cause of death, but noticed things like signs of asphyxiation, abrasions on Cherry's forehead, 
nose, and cheeks. Cherry was found upside down and the top of her shoes had marks which were consistent with her being dragged. The autopsy did conclude though that there was no soot in Cherry's airways so she was already dead before she was burned. Dr. Lan also talked about Cherry's medical records and it was noted that in January of 2003, Cherry self-reported a seizure and in September of 2004, she self-reported another seizure. She was prescribed anti-seizure medication and it was also noted that if she did not take the medication for more than a month, she could possibly have another seizure. In 2004, she was prescribed Wilbutrin and one side effect from that medication was seizures. On February 10th, 2010, Cherry self-reported having severe seizures and she told the doctor that she would black out. When the doctor went over symptoms of seizures, Cherry denied experiencing those symptoms. On April 5th, 2010, there was another visit to the hospital and Cherry self-reported having another seizure, but after being questioned by the doctor, the doctor concluded that she only had tremors, not seizures. Dr. Lan did note that in her files, it did say she had epilepsy unspecified, despite what the other doctors reported. Even though Dr. Lan let the court know that there were low levels of her anti-seizure medication in her system during the autopsy, she still testified that she did not believe Cherry died from a seizure. She also talked about how the bruise on Cherry's tongue was not consistent with a person who had a seizure and bit down on their tongue. She also said it was not reasonable for a nurse like Kimberly to watch someone have a seizure and not do anything. After Dr. Land testified, a neurologist by the name of Dr. Richard Ulrich testified. Dr. Ulrich said that Cherry had generalized tonic-clonic seizures and she would stiffen up and jerk with her head back and eyes rolled up. She would go unconscious briefly and wake up confused, but she would be back to her normal self after about an hour or so. Dr. Ulrich noted that Cherry's seizures started when she was 16 years old. He prescribed her anti-seizure medication in 2003, and she did not have seizures if she consistently took her medication. He also noted that the results of the medication levels in her blood were low because the autopsy was conducted more than 24 hours after her death, and they would have been higher if the test was given right after she died. A CAT scan was taken of Cherry's brain and it showed no abnormalities. He also let the court know that in the past, she did run out of her medication for more than a month and she still did not have a seizure. Dr. Ulrich testified that it is possible for a person to die of a seizure, but in his 40 years of practicing medicine, he had never seen it happen. He also acknowledged that there was such a thing as sudden, unexpected death in epilepsy syndrome. He testified that it was not likely that Cherry died from a seizure even if she was under stress. The state asked Dr. Ulrich to clarify what not likely meant, and he said that there was a less than 10% chance that she died from a seizure. Only two to 3% of epilepsy patients die from sudden unexpected death in epilepsy in the absence of other underlying problems. After the doctors were done testifying, it was now time for the prosecution to bring up Kimberly's arrest record for assaulting people and her failures to appear in court. After that, it was now time for the people who had negative encounters with Kimberly to take the stand. One of the first witnesses was Jonna Booker. Jonna was one of Kimberly's son's fourth grade teacher. She said that she met Kimberly at Meet the Teacher Night, and she said that she tried speaking to Kimberly's son, but Kimberly kept interrupting her son and giving him angry looks. She also witnessed Kimberly's younger son running around in circles, and Kimberly grabbed him forcefully by the arm and jerked him back inappropriately and more forcefully than necessary. Jonna said that there were other things that bothered her that school year, like how Kimberly's son would stiffen up and shy away from personal contact. One time, she also recognized that there was a thumbprint-sized bruise on his arm. He would also wear long sleeve shirts in warm months like he was covering something up. Lastly, she said that if the student ever got less than 96% on an assignment, Kimberly would request that he be given extra assignments. Jonna said that she always refused because she felt that her son was a great student already, and this upset Kimberly even more. Jonna felt that after the boy went to live with his father, he seemed more relaxed and less fearful. The defense then spoke with Jonna and let her know that the boy had nothing but brothers he would roughhouse with, and he also played football, so he could have gotten the bruise from anywhere. The prosecution questioned Jonna a second time and asked her if she believed the bruise on her student came from Kimberly, and she replied by saying yes. After Jonna testified, Tracy Carter was next to take to the stand. Tracy was another teacher of Kimberly's son, and she too met Kimberly at teacher meet night. She said that Kimberly was mad when she found out her son would have four different teachers. She got upset and left. It wasn't until an hour and a half later, Kimberly showed up again crying. 
She was upset that another parent cut her in line while she was waiting to meet the teacher. She was asked if she ever noticed bruises on her student, and she said yes, but that the student always had a story for how he got the bruise. Tracy then said if her student was ever touched on the shoulder or back, he would flinch. He appeared very nervous and unhappy when he was living with Kimberly. Jonna and Tracy were both asked if they thought Kimberly had a mental disorder, but there was an objection and both women were not able to answer the question. Next to take to the stand was an elderly woman in her 70s by the name of Barbara Chamberlain. Kimberly dated Barbara's step-grandson back in the day, but she said she had not seen Kimberly since 1999 after Kimberly physically assaulted her. She said that one day she saw some wet photographs in the front lawn and she picked them up and brought them in her house. When Kimberly realized the photos were in Barbara's possession, she assaulted her. Kimberly's assault was reduced to a Class C misdemeanor and she was able to avoid court and only had to pay a fine. The state asked Barbara, Do you think she twisted your arm to get the photo or to hurt you? Barbara replied by saying, To hurt me. Barbara ended her testimony by saying Kimberly was very possessive over her grandson, Matt. After Barbara testified, Kimberly's first husband, Michael West, testified. During trial, Michael and Kimberly's son was 21 years old and attending college. He said that when they were married, Kimberly's anger was explosive and extreme. She would often throw dangerous objects at him, and he said that one time she even drove their car into the wall of the garage on purpose. The state showed Michael an old picture of his son, and there was a bruise under his chin. He said that times were rough back then, and he is the one who filed for divorce, and after the divorce, their son was initially living with Kimberly full-time. When the divorce was finalized, he got custody of his son, and Kimberly's supervised visits changed when their son turned 12 because their son no longer wanted them. He also said that CPS was involved and told him that if he did not protect his son from Kimberly, they would have to take him away. Michael said that this was the reason he acted fast to get custody of his son. His son had no want to see his mother and was actually struggling with sleep knowing he would have to testify in court and see his mother after so many years. Michael had not seen Kimberly in about 10 years. Michael knew about claims of assault, but he was scared because Kimberly was a clever, manipulative, and controlling liar. She once told a judge that her mother was dead, the same mother who had testified in court and was clearly alive. Kimberly also accused Michael of trying to bribe judges. He said on one occasion, Kimberly kicked his new wife and took their son away from home. Michael was also arrested before because Kimberly made up a story that he assaulted her. He had to do six months of probation, even though he never laid a finger on Kimberly. He said that he had it bad when they were married, but he thinks that her other ex-husband, Matt Robinson, had it the worst. In his closing statements, he said that his son had to get therapy for 10 years from what he endured with Kimberly. He also said that there was no doubt in his mind the extreme lengths Kimberly will go, and for that reason, he never kept a gun in their house. After Michael testified, his and Kimberly's eldest son, David West, testified. He said that he only has one or two good memories of his mother, and he is still scared of her till this day. The state showed Michael an old photo where he was smiling and had a bruise. He was questioned about what happened, and David initially said he remembers, but did not want to talk about it. Eventually, he said that he was assaulted with a brush and his mother's hands. Prosecutors asked him if the smile in the photo was real, and he said no. After bringing up more incidents involving his mother, David said that he no longer wanted to be there. Despite his statement, the questions continued. The state questioned him about an event that happened with his stepmother, Sonia, and his stepsister. He said that Kimberly tried to take him and his stepsister, but they were both fighting to get away. Sonia finally pulled up and tried to get his stepsister away from Kimberly, but Kimberly smashed Sonia's arm against a brick wall, took him, and sped off. He, just like his father, also had dangerous objects constantly thrown at him. He said he believes Kimberly is manipulative, mean, and controlling. He said that when she lost custody, he would let her know when he wanted to see her again, and that day has never come. Next, Sonia West took to the stand. Sonia was married to Michael for 18 years, and she recounted an incident that happened on August 1st, 1997 in Rockwall County. She said that on that day, her nanny Glenda, David, and her daughter Leanne were all at the house together. She ended up leaving work so she could be home when Kimberly came to pick up David. She said her ex-husband called and said Kimberly was picking up Leanne and bringing her to her father. Leanne was saying bye to her mom, and Kimberly got agitated because she was in a hurry, so she picked up Leanne by the arms to where she was completely off the ground. When Sonia tried going after them, 
She said Kimberly shoved her against a brick wall and kicked her in the stomach and then ran after David. After Sonia testified, her daughter testified, and then Sergeant Brad Merritt testified after her. Sergeant Brad Merritt said that he received a phone call from someone asking if the police department received any reports or threats. The call was on July 25, 1997. He said the caller said she called her ex-husband and said she was going to find his wife in a dark alley and twist her head off. Sergeant Merritt told the caller that what was being said was a serious threat and the caller hung up. On August 1, 1997, right in front of a Rockwall police officer, Kimberly said that if she ever found Sonia West in a dark alley, she would twist her head right off. This statement was heard by Sergeant Merritt, who had answered the anonymous phone call on July 25th, so he knew the caller was Kimberly Cargill. The state then called Ryan Cargill to the stand. He said that his marriage to Kimberly was the worst time of his life. He said that they dated for three months before Kimberly got pregnant, and they weren't even planning on marrying until she got pregnant. He claimed that Kimberly was violent in nature and had once thrown a hammer at him. She also punched him on Christmas. When they divorced, Kimberly had custody of their son, but in September of 2006, he won custody of their son. Kimberly's mother and sister took to the stand as well. Kimberly's sister said that Kimberly was a clever and manipulative person and referred to her as a devil. Kimberly's mother said that Kimberly often lost her temper and wanted everything her way. She also overheard her daughter saying she wanted to kill her, but she ended her testimony by saying that no matter how rocky their relationship was, she still loved her daughter and only wanted to see the best in her. Mrs. Walker took to the stand, fighting back tears. She said that most of Cherry's friends were caretakers and bus drivers or people who had the responsibility of looking after her. The state questioned her about a man named Joseph, someone who could have possibly been the male that Kimberly made up during her testimony when she claimed Cherry wanted to meet up with a white man at a bar. Mrs. Walker said that Joseph was a friend whom Cherry was never intimate with. They met back in 1997 at a Goodwill where they both were working. The location had an opportunity for people with disabilities to work there. She claimed that Joseph was one of few friends Cherry had, and he knew not to hurt Cherry by initiating any type of intimacy with her. The district attorney apologized for asking so many questions, and she replied by saying, It's okay. That was my baby. When it was time for the closing statements, the state asked the judge to increase Kimberly's bond to $5 million, and the judge complied. District attorney Matt Bingham started by mentioning key testimonies and pointing out how Kimberly was a liar and was controlling. He talked about a video that was shown during trial where she was with White House PD, and he said that that was the real Kimberly, not the Kimberly that was sitting in front of the jury. Attorney Bingham described how Kimberly left Cherry's body with no respect and called her a fruit bag and a cook. He brought up Angela Hardin's testimony, a friend who was asked by Kimberly to lie on the stand, but was strong enough to do the opposite and tell the truth. He claimed that Kimberly did not care about Cherry at all and even threw away her beloved coin purse. He brought up how Cherry's father had to call the sheriff's office on Father's Day 2010 to ask if the burnt body found on the side of the road was his daughter's. Brett Harrison then began the closing arguments for the defense. He brought up how the doctor said it was unlikely Cherry had a seizure, but it did not mean it was not possible. He said that his client just panicked because Cherry's condition was bad and it would have made her look bad. He then went over receipts, which proved that Kimberly did in fact take Cherry to Posada's restaurant that night and asked the jury why she would have gotten cash out when she got gas at an Exxon if she was just going to take Cherry back to her garage to murder her. Harrison was quoted saying, Yes, she dumped her body. She did set her afire and made no bones about it. As disgusting as what she did to Cherry Walker's body is, that doesn't equal homicide. Where's the proof? Where's the evidence that Kim Cargill killed Cherry Walker? Where is the proof? Where is the evidence to show you it was a homicide and not something else? How sure do you have to be before you jump out of a plane? Kimberly's diagnosis of personality disorder that was given to her 20 years prior was then brought up. Jeff Hawes represented the defense as well, and he told the jury that it was not their duty to prove Cargill was innocent. It was the state's duty to prove that she is guilty. He said that if Kimberly was so cold and calculated, she would have calculated something better than what she did with Cherry's body. The state's prosecutor, Attorney Bingham, told the jury, that they could find Kimberly guilty of murder instead of capital murder if they choose. 
He said, however, that they may only find her guilty of murder instead of capital murder if they believe Cherry was not subpoenaed and Kimberly did not kill Cherry Walker as a result. The judge presiding over the case told the jury that there are two questions they must answer when deciding punishment. He said they must decide whether Ms. Cargill presents a continuing threat to society and whether there were mitigating circumstances that would have caused her to commit the crime. He told the jury that they had to answer yes to the first question and no to the second. If the jury were to answer those questions in that way, they would have to sentence Kimberly to death. Defense said they should not look into Kimberly's 20-year history of assault and violence. Instead, they should look at her good behavior over the past couple of years she has been in jail. He also tried to say that a mitigating factor to not receive death was the fact that Kimberly was once diagnosed with personality disorder. April Sykes made the state's final argument. She spoke for over an hour, and she talked about how hard she had been working on the case for the past two years out of love for Cherry. April began crying multiple times during her closing arguments and said that Kimberly was a murderer and that the jury was lucky they had the chance to stop Kimberly and her lies. She asked the jury to find her guilty of capital murder and sentence her to death. In May of 2012, Kimberly was found guilty of capital murder and she was sentenced to death. April Sykes spoke to the court and said, We are so pleased that Cherry Walker has received justice and Kim Cargill will not hurt anyone anymore. It was truly an honor to have the opportunity to represent Cherry, her family, and the community in this case. It's been an emotional two years for me. I've become so emotionally attached to Cherry Walker and her family. She's so childlike. Miss Walker left a legacy of protection for Miss Cargill's children. They are now safe. Mrs. Walker, Cherry's stepmother, spoke to Kimberly in her impact statement. Miss Cargill, Cherry loved you, and she loved your son. She didn't deserve the horrible thing you did. You took her away from the people that loved her. When I saw my baby in the morgue, her eyebrows singed. You took away my memories of her. I couldn't give her a beautiful pink dress. All I had was a black body bag. We don't hate you. We only have love, pity, and compassion for you. Jesus loves you, and he will forgive you. It was documented that Kimberly showed no emotion when she was sentenced to death by lethal injection, but she did tear up when Mrs. Walker spoke to her. Kimberly was sent to death row at the Mountain View unit in Gatesville, Texas. Kimberly did try to appeal her case in 2017. One point of her appeal was that it should not have been permissible for CPS to testify that she violated a voluntary agreement because it was voluntary and not mandatory. She also said that witnesses should not have been able to talk about her assaults during trial because they were all hearsay. In her sixth point of error, Kimberly asserted that the trial court erred in overruling her objection to the prosecutor's improper and inflammatory closing argument at the guilt phase. She said that one of the prosecutors called her a liar, complained about how long she had to work on the case, expressed personal hatred towards Kimberly, bolstered her own argument by saying good things about herself, and called the defense counsel liars. Here is what the prosecutor said word for word. They told you that, oh, she might have died of a seizure, a seizure, a seizure, a seizure. Who have we heard that from? That liar over there, Cargill. And let me make something real clear. I never said she was smart. I think she's stupid and a lot of other things. How dare she lie about that woman? And if it doesn't make you mad, it ought to. It ought to infuriate you. It's pitiful. It's pathetic that she can come in here in this court of law after I've worked for two years with that sheriff's office out there and throw it out there and her lawyer go, well, would you jump out of a plane? Who cares about a plane? The lead prosecutor is right about one thing. I care about Cherry Walker. I sure do. And I despise the woman that killed her more than I can ever explain to you ever. Because you know why she killed her? She's retarded. That's why she did it. I told y'all in Vordi, the ones I questioned, that anybody that knew me knew one thing, that I would always, till the day I die, stand up for a kid. I'd give my life for a child. And there's one right there. How lawyers can stand in this courtroom and say things that aren't true is beyond me. Objection, Your Honor. It's overruled. It's argument. The U.S. Supreme Court replied in her denial that she admitted in court to being a liar and lying on multiple occasions. They also said, even assuming error, however, we conclude that the prosecutor's comment does not warrant a reverse. With that, her appeal was denied and the U.S. Supreme Court has refused to review any other appeals for Kimberly to date. 
Thank you all for watching. Let me know what you guys think of this story in the comments below.